very good afternoon to each one of you. On behalf of the Bangalore Chamber of Industry and Commerce, we welcome each one of you to the session on managing wave two, sharing industry's best practice. As you're all aware that uh, with the present surge in the wave two, uh, we have lost many of our friends, colleagues, known contacts and all, and the people who are working in the industry. So I request all of you uh, to be silent for a minute or two. May all the departed uh, soul be rest in peace. Uh, thank you for your patience and understanding. Uh, so before we move forward, uh, this session has been organized under the AGs of Human Resources and Women Empowerment and Leadership Expert Committee of BCIC. We'd like to especially thank uh, the leaders of the Expert Committee, Mr. Augustus, Ms. Lavanya, Mr. B. Mr. B. Parmeshwaran, Mr. B. C. Prabhakar, and all the members of the Expert Committee for curating this session for the benefit of our members in such a short time. The session aims to share the insights on how companies are helping employees way through the COVID related challenges and the panelists will share their best practices on how organizations are managing employees, wellness, safety and care during these difficult times. The panelists for today's sessions are Mr. Anandru Ghosh, partner, Human Capital Consulting, Deloitte Toshu, Tomasu LLP. Uh, Dr. Nilima, chairperson of Indian Medical Association Committee for Emotional Well-Being of Medical Students and Doctors in India. Mr. Siddharth Vishwanath, HR Head, Zuwami. Mr. Eve Vaithyanathan, MD and founder, FAQS. Ms. Anuset, director and co-founder, Pay It Forward. Dr. Anupama, professor of RV Institute of Management. Mr. Abe Abraham, partner, manager, Cyril Amarchand Mangaldas. Ms. Abe Jani, partner, Kocher and Co. Company. The session will be moderated by Mr. Agassiz, who is the chairman of the HR and Women Empowerment and Leadership Export Committee, BCIC, and HR leader at IBM India and South Asia. On behalf of BCIC, we express our sincere thanks to all the speakers for accepting our invitation to address on this important subject. We would also like to thank all the participants for joining today's session. We request all the participants to kindly mute their mic and webcam option. I request only the panelists to have their uh, webcam and the panelists open. So that which will avoid all any disturbance in the background. Please post your questions on the chat box only. The panelists will respond to the question during the session. And in case if time do not permit, we shall be sharing the queries to the panelists and sh shall revert back accordingly. May I now invite Mr. Augustus to take forward the session. Thanking you once again all. Over to you, Augustus. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Prithvi, for the support from the Secretariat to bring this program uh, to our members at very, very short notice. And uh, like you all know, uh, the wave two has been so severe, completely unprecedented and taken a lot of us by surprise. Along with it, it has also taken a huge toll on life. Uh, and uh, we had received um, requests from our members uh, to help them uh, to ride this second wave and what are the best practices or experiences that uh, each of us could have 
to enable our members uh, to go through this second wave. The focus, of course, is on people, human capital, uh, and of course, on what are those things that uh, organizations are doing uh, and what is it that uh, people uh, definitely need and require. We're also going to focus a little bit on the regulatory aspect of it, the emotional aspect of it, both mental and uh, physical well-being. Uh, and uh, needless to say, some of the uh, impacts it has been having, right? Uh, we were just talking a short while ago and said, uh, OK, industrial oxygen is supposed to be uh, now uh, con converted to medical oxygen. And therefore, industries that have been, uh, you know, depending on this raw material, they will uh, or they will suffer. OK, so we're in a dichotomy of sorts, but nevertheless, we have to take a call. And then we also have the worker population, some of them migratory, some of them contractual. Uh, and then we have the government coming up with various norms, you know, whether it is uh, for the lockdown or whether it is about how you're going to uh, continue to run your industry during a lockdown. So there are myriad issues uh, that are in front of us. And uh, like uh, we have said earlier, we've all risen to the occasion. OK. Now, rising to the occasion, is that sustainable or is that heroism only for that particular time? OK, this and a lot more is going to be discussed by all those eight panelists uh, that uh, Prithvi introduced short while ago. And these are highly resourceful people uh, drawn from most of the sectors and uh, parts of our industry that we represent. And uh, with that, I'm going to uh, request Dr. Nilima. Uh, to share with us her experiences, best practices. Thank you so much. Augustus, our president has logged in. Our president is there. Sorry, Dr. Nilima, can I just take a minute to welcome president and ask him to also welcome us and address us briefly? Thank you, Mr. Yes. President. I hope this finds you well. Yeah. Uh, president, I request you to kindly share your uh, thoughts and then a small intro from your side, sir. President, sir, you have to unmute, sir. You're on mute. A very good evening. Sorry, my sincere apologies for logging in late. I had some challenges in the network. I was in the other call with Japan. I'm sorry. So first of all, uh, hearty congratulations on this program. It was a very important program uh, to share the best practices of the industry in the COVID times. And I'm very happy that uh, today there are a lot of interesting speakers to share their experiences. But nevertheless, I think uh, every day the COVID has been a kind of, uh, you know, the learnings from this COVID uh, phase one and phase two, the pandemic has been a great learning for all of us. In fact, today morning, I was just reviewing the progress of my project with uh, my local team and with the Japanese people. I think uh, today we're able to conduct virtual audits with all the suppliers across the length and breadth of the globe. Otherwise, uh, we would be traveling, uh, you know, thousands of kilometers. And, uh, you know, we are actually uh, saving a lot of money. Otherwise, even if you look at uh, Toyota, we save billions of dollars uh, in the global travel. And all of our meetings are literally virtual. And uh, today we have developed a lot of platforms wherein we can conduct uh, virtual simulations and anything is possible under the sun. So thanks to the technological advancement of uh, 3D simulations, artificial intelligence and machine learning, I think there has been a tremendous progress. So uh, nevertheless, uh, you know, everything has uh, to start and everything has to end and nothing is permanent in life. I think that's what we have learned. Therefore, uh, whenever there is a good time, there's going to be a bad time and vice versa. But uh, there is a learning is constant. Every uh, good and bad time uh, will uh, result in a lot of learnings and reflections. And I think if you're able to rotate the PDCA, we call the plan, do, check, and act. And every time we rotate the PDCA, I think that's where the prosperity and growth happens. And, uh, you know, the learning is in every function. I think HR is working, uh, you know, new ways of uh, managing business. Uh, you know, they are working on several new initiatives. Uh, you know, we are working on paperless office and uh, paperless uh, digital boards, then paperless recruitment and, uh, you know, paperless evaluations. 
and uh, face uh, meetings yeah, but uh, very difficult to connect with people uh, without the actual uh, meeting that is another challenge because people are not machines most of us keep talking about this the big subject that's going on but how do we keep the emotional quotient on while uh, we're able to manage the covid uh, crisis because uh, we need to connect with people i think connecting with people is the greatest thing in business i feel that's 95 percent so once you're able to connect with people i think all other things happen but today we're not able to connect with people on a, an emotional quotient i think uh, this is a big challenge and of course uh, uh, you know covid has taught us several ways of uh, saving the cost i think be it the plant efficiency energy cost reductions uh, cost innovations in the office uh, automation i think uh, ways and means of uh, reducing the indirect manpower let me tell you uh, my own experience uh, we are setting up a new project uh, for our hybrid gasoline cars and uh, normally we would have recruited a lot of people for our project and uh, this time uh, i said very clearly that uh, we should not recruit any indirect manpower you know normally we constitute almost 40 50 percent of direct manpower is indirect manpower for people to be augmented in manufacturing production control logistics production engineering but let me tell you my own experience uh, we managed to get uh, not even uh, we we managed to get uh, 100 percent results and not a single person is recruited i think this is something phenomenal uh, means uh, the necessity is the mother of invention once you are put in the ocean you have to swim naturally that's exactly what has happened so once uh, people are given that crisis point and there's a good direction uh, i think uh, definitely uh, we get magical results and uh, so much of innovations people are come out with ways and means of reducing the manpower and uh, stretching lean management and people are now seamlessly working around the clock on all functions no need to come to the office because at least uh, three years back some people used to tell uh, we can work from home for manufacturing companies it is next to a nightmare actually people would uh, literally laugh it out but today it has become a reality the manufacturing companies are working from home uh, accepting the operators uh, were to do the physical job but there also we had done a fantastic way of uh, segregating them keeping the ideal social distance then uh, sanitation hygiene yeah. and uh, masking and the face mask both we are given and i think that this is working out very well all the canteens we have put all partitions like individual compartments you know today that is uh, very much available in the office also therefore i think uh, now the industries are fully geared i would say largely and uh, we have uh, shared a lot of best practices from bangalore chambers and also the toyota's best practices and other companies like big companies like tata we all shared to all our member companies and uh, today uh, we are ready for the covid but at the same time the environment is not so conducive in fact now people are talking about a lockdown now I'm getting a lot of calls. What's going to happen next in Bangalore? So I'm also trying to talk to some senior bureaucrats. But you know, uh, we are very, very much ready for the lockdown. The industries we are fully prepared. But uh, unfortunately, we have a huge export commitment. Many companies have committed. Therefore, a lot of my friends are calling me and say that you know we should not go for a lockdown. You see, definitely, I'm sure that the government will consider it favorably because industries are going through a challenging times. At the same time, uh, managing the life and livelihood, uh, the Prime Minister's vision, the government is always concerned. So I hope some good wisdom should come out. So why I'm trying to talk all these things is, you see, the, at every struggle, there is a great learning. In fact, if I uh, look at, uh, be it an ITBT company or an engineering company or a service sector, I think uh, there's a huge learning. And the biggest advantage is these learnings are going to be continual which means they are uh, eternal. It's not just, you know, you learn today and forget it tomorrow. So many of these practices can uh, be stretched beyond uh, uh, this COVID time, and it is uh, most of them are eternal. And secondly, the biggest change that has happened is technological breakthroughs. I think uh, these technologies have literally sprung uh, in an accelerated way. I would say at least we are again uh, by 15, 10 to 15 years, uh, thanks to COVID. 
because otherwise you not have uh, been applying artificial intelligence or machine learning or big data you know 3d computing or you know quantum leap or uh, the digital platforms uh, which is chain blockchains i think these have been undergoing a huge changes in the last one two years and these it companies if you look at they are in the best of their growth globally you name any it company they are doing their best and thanks to the covid but the biggest beauty is once this comes to be applied in big companies and small companies in fact uh, this digital transformation should happen across the supply chain in fact i was talking to the finance minister and recently uh, with mr piyush goel also that the digital transformation uh, is the way for small companies today there is a huge allergy you know when it uh, comes to digital transformation people are scared that it is huge cost increase but i can assure there are lots of low hanging fruits and uh, every company can apply these techniques and uh, i'll be surprised to see that many people have not understood the basic usage of cell phones and ipads i think i was uh, shocked to know that uh, people can only operate at 5% of the efficiency of the ipad at an average ipad can give you umpteen number of solutions but with a single ipad you can manage everything you don't need to have a computer all your meetings all your transactions all your uh, uh, everything you name anything it can be done with a single ipad and that is the power of computing today and today it's available at a terabyte uh, therefore uh, all i'm trying to say is uh, you know we have to widen our knowledge in the digital space we need to reach this knowledge down the supply chain to bring uh, more people into the fold and especially uh, the futuristic of manufacturing in fact i always keep talking about this when you look at india and china always people compare uh, the two countries to me it's not a big comparison because china is almost five times when you look at the car population it is almost 30 million india is at 3 million so 10 times the size so it's not a comparison on the economies of scale but all we can do is the learnings from china definitely we can uh, horizontally deploy to the indian companies in fact one such learning is a cluster program where uh, we can concentrate on areas of excellence in model districts and we can reap a huge economies of scale and government of karnataka has taken nine districts to manufacture toys in plants electronic items and so on and so forth they like copal you know tumkur uh, mysore like that for icit i think this kind of learning and second thing is india is going to migrate from uh, service to manufacturing whereas china because of the aging population they are going from service to manufacturing to service normally the reverse thing is happening in india normally organizations mature from manufacturing to service but india is moving from service which is 60% now and we are getting into manufacturing whether we like it or not we will not only be the factory of the world but we will also be a market india which means because of captive consumption there is a market within india and uh, thanks to the aging population of the rest of the world like japan china and many of the european countries india will become a seat of manufacture for many other countries and export will happen from india therefore manufacturing is going to grow in leaps and bounds so that manufacturing again will be a kind of integrated manufacturing all these internet of things 3d printing this machine learning artificial intelligence iot they'll all get integrated to form a new set of manufacturing paradigm and uh, this is going to really rule the world yeah, therefore there is a huge opportunity existing in the uh, digital uh, platform and the cyber security is also equally important associated problems will come therefore uh, these industries are going to grow associated industries supporting these kind of manufacturing activities and we also need a lot of new skill sets on uh, the conventional skill sets will be there but the new skill sets uh, on the digital platform we need to train the young people young minds and the remote offices remote locations people can work seamlessly across the globe and you can operate from any location and today if i give my talk my talk can be fairly played in a hologram in hundreds of locations simultaneously in the world in 100 different languages and without the people knowing that uh, i am not physical i think uh, thanks to the kind of this kind of transformations no more travel is required and businesses will become more virtual 
therefore given this kind of a great learning from this i think i'm sure that uh, the learning is unlimited i would say in every field and especially education sector if you take i think today the classes are all conducted online and the new educational policy which is a great paradigm shift in the recent times i also happened to be in the the chair of the advisory council for the national economic education policy for the indo universal education so where we are trying to bring in new models of education like today we have selected some 10 colleges across the country and we are trying to impart an education which is very easy to understand which is very practical with 50% of uh, vocational courses attached to that and we also try to drive in the team building the networking the principles of indian uh, ethos value systems lessons learned from hindu dharma many many things and bhagavad gita bible quran and so forth so these are all the kind of new things that is happening on the educational field as well and uh, e learning is going to achieve its peak and the physical classes are going to become uh, more and more smaller in number and uh, the 3d simulations uh, to eight this kind of institutions will be big in number therefore uh, every field if you take i think today if you take the medical medicine you have online consultations doctors no more can talk to you in physical platforms you can see the doctor meet the doctor show your reports it's much better than a practical you know physical meeting so every field has uh, attained its significance thanks to the covid therefore sky is not the limit is what i would like to say and once again i hope that today's session you are going to hear from a lot of thought leaders and i don't want to take much of your time i thought i will set this kind of a background uh, uh, in your mind and i hope that you'll have a wonderful session to uh, you know listen to for the rest of the evening thank you augustus and thank you all for the patient listening god bless god bless thank you so much uh, parasusan uh, for setting the context and for uh, you know giving us uh, a complete comprehensive overview of everything and with that you know i would like to uh, you know invite a doctor uh, you know on to this round table and uh, you know people have generally advised me you know not to stress myself and generally they say don't stress or increase your anxiety because that reduces your immunity so it compromises on immunity and uh, we have dr nilima kadambi she's the chairperson indian medical association committee for emotional well being of medical students and doctors in india in a sense i think she's the doctor's doctor thank you so much dr nilima let's hear from you a very good afternoon to all of you my nickname in the national society is the happiness doctor they say the only thing more infectious than the covid virus is nilima's smile <laughs> <laughs> so i say keep smiling keep laughing and that is the best way to de stress you started by making a statement which says stress reduces immunity and if anything the covid pandemic has taught us is the importance of safeguarding our individual immunity as well as the immunity of our community because this is not just a infection that one person has but that spreads rapidly within families within societies within nations and across the globe so yes stress is something we all have as an integral part of our life and stress becomes half full only if you allow it to become distress because there is a term called you stress or a good stress and this is something that actually helps us perform it is that little bit of you stress that probably sachin tendulkar feels when he's the opening batsman but that's what helped him for the centuries or an athlete before they take off from their starting point at the gunshot but you stress is something that helps us peak our performance and it is good for the body because it is short lived at the end of it it usually ends with something feeling positive a sense of achievement or good things whereas chronic stress or repeated stress and high stress that doesn't give you the time to de stress is what is most harmful to us and thanks to covid today we are talking about this i think all of you will agree that in the industry and especially in the it not that other industries were immune but people were working under high chronic stress 
and burnout, fatigue, as well as mental breakdowns was happening over and over, but it was not at the forefront of people's thought process. It was brushed aside. And those who suffered, suffered silently, or were like the walking wounded who continued to perform, but at a huge cost to themselves, either in terms of physical health, emotional health, mental health, as well as family and relationship health. More divorces, more uh, uh, people giving up on their profession because they couldn't cope with it, or more people resorting to unhealthy coping skills like mechanism, not skills, of drugs, alcohol, tobacco, or anything else. So we now have the opportunity to address this not on a reaction basis that let's how, know how to de-stress. No, let's accept that stress is a part of life and you can't say, once in a year, I'll take a vacation, go to a spa, and get all my stress pushed out of my body with massages and pampering. Or uh, every month, I'll go on a binge drinking with my friends, and that will take care of all the stress. No. Today, we have learned that we need to invest in our own wellness, in our own emotional well-being on a daily basis. And something that I tell when I, I, I'm a volunteer for the government of India doing I've done more than 2,750 free telecounseling for COVID positive families. And what I keep reminding them is to look at what is still available to them within their home and within themselves as support system and to focus on this positive. So the honest truth is, though it's very scary, the numbers and the second wave is galloping away, we don't know where, but the honest truth is 98.5% are still surviving this infection and 85% don't need to go to hospital and another 5% could also be managed at home if you created support system and there's no need to panic there really is no need to start thinking of the worst case scenario it doesn't mean you become an ostrich and be in denial but let's focus on what we can do every day five to ten minutes of deep breathing in fresh air morning and evening you can call it pranayama, you can call it whistling, singing, dancing, anything that helps you to breathe deeply is something that refreshes you. A small connection with nature, whether it's plants, whether it's your potted plant on your veranda or a park, whether it's birds or butterflies or anything else that soothes the soul, it's something inherently positive that helps you recharge your batteries. Doing that for yourself Enjoy your cup of tea on your balcony. Get up 10 minutes early just to get that time and recharge your batteries for the day. And the most effective de-stressor of all, for all of you who have children, if not uh, play with the children next door, and it can be a virtual game also, just laughing and giggling and being childlike for 15, 20 minutes every day towards the end of the day. You'll sleep much better and you'll wake up feeling refreshed. That is not enough. You need to take care of yourself in terms of uh, hydration, in terms of nutrition, in terms of supplementation. A lot of people may say, why do you need supplements? Good old days, grandmas didn't need to take supplements. But today our air, water and soil being so polluted doesn't give us enough nutritive inputs as we need. As an apple a day keeps the doctor away no longer. You'd have to eat a whole crate of apple every day to get the same nutrition. And then you'd probably get other problems. So let's not kid ourselves. Supplement is, is a requirement these days. And the cleaner, greener, and calmer uh, environment that you can live in, the less need for supplements. Why is everybody saying take zinc if you're diagnosed with COVID? Because the virus depletes the zinc in your body. It's a micronutrient. So we're now popping zinc tablets. But anytime the body is under stress, not just with COVID, it utilizes far more of your nutrition and your metabolic requirements go up. It's like if you drive a car continuously in first gear and accelerate all the time, you're going to consume much more fuel and the engine is going to heat up. That's exactly what happens to our body. And therefore, taking that time to unwind, de-stress, and find whatever it is that helps you just be at peace within yourself and be happy is something that you need to do on a daily basis. And today, people are focusing on that as a need. 
and as organizations i would encourage you all to improve your patient your employees well being by insisting on what i call as me time everybody needs me time and women especially need it much more because believe it or not even in this day and age of the 21st century there is a much higher pressure on women who are doing full time jobs to still take the majority of the pressure on the home front and with work from home study from home and uh, isolate at home imagine how much more pressure on that lady and there are some of the counselings that i have done she was a bahu of a joint family and she hadn't even tested positive she just had some symptoms but she says nahi koi baat nahi main 15 din reh jaungi room mein bas mujhe jhadu pocha nahi karna hai khana nahi pakana hai bas manga lungi mujhe juice chahiye mujhe wo chahiye she thought she was getting a big break and she didn't even want to test herself and wanted to do 15 days of quarantine and today the sad truth is there are 500 plus resident doctors in maharashtra alone who have tested positive and when i counsel them as part of our doctors for doctors initiative in the dima many of them are saying ma'am we are not worried we are young we have taken the vaccine we know we'll get better the biggest relief is for 15 days we don't have to put on a pp and go and do eight hours duty how sad is that that an illness is welcome just to get a break let's not wait to be ill to uh, uh, take breaks let's take breaks regularly some people who work continuously on their computer i say take breaks every hour and a half 10 minute break recharge yourself give your eyes rest give your back rest and you will be much fitter but in the long run everybody has to figure out what they need now coming specifically to the pandemic i thought i'm not exceeding my time is that uh, people are concerned about not getting a bed in the hospital not getting oxygen when they need it but you know it's not a true shortage some of it is like the us why was there toilet paper shortage when the first pandemic hit because everybody was holding it so a lot of people in panic have tried to buy oxygen concentrators and oxygen cylinders and in black and all of that and creating a deficit for where they really need it let's trust that there is a system there is some method to the madness and as one who has been volunteering over the last 14 months i know the bbmp in karnataka and bangalore is doing an amazing job they are all overworked all stressed and i keep reminding them to take breaks too and i do sessions for these volunteer doctors and volunteer citizens to also keep uh, themselves charged so that they don't burn out while doing this so right now there is no end in sight of when it will finish so we have to keep ourselves paced like a marathon runner we are not here for the sprint and everybody is a winner as long as you finish and you're still alive with that i'll close but if there are specific questions with covid related stuff with treatment protocols or with vaccine i'm happy to take it later thank you very much thank you so much uh, doctor uh, just a couple uh, thoughts here uh, you know that we would like you to shed some light on um, this is also impacted women in the workforce right because women are now primary caregivers and therefore they are moving away from the workforce so that is definitely a here and now problem that we are facing that is one uh the second one also is uh, i heard about domestic violence uh, you know going up okay some of your thoughts around this doctor it is true the women in our workforce have been impacted even higher and uh, i can talk about the doctors and nurses who are actually living in residence quarters attached to the hospitals or in hotels taken over by the hospital to prevent carrying infections home and to allow them to work and so they are insulated from that double whammy of doing your job 8 10 hours a day plus taking care of everything at home and there's only one simple solution that to include your family in the chores at home when we were abroad both of us were doctors both of us were working my daughter as small as 3 would take a little dusting cloth and go along with me when i used to do this mopping and swabbing saying i'm mama's happy helper Yeah, my husband, who had never picked up a, a, a cup of coffee for himself, learned to do laundry and learned to do ironing of his clothes. So I say this is a great opportunity for families to come together, and there is no shame in asking for help. It's a lot of time women don't ask for help, thinking it's a weakness. They should not feel so, and husbands, fathers, brothers, sons should not feel that they are helping their mother or their sister or their spouse. 
they are just sharing responsibilities of a home that is a home for both of them. And when the home has become a workplace and a study place, it is all the more sacrosanct that everybody shares in the chores, whether it's cooking, whether it's cleaning, whether it's just being supportive of each other, and whether it's taking care of each other's needs. And that would reduce the burden and allow women also to work and continue to enjoy their professional careers without having to compromise on the care of their loved ones or their elderly people. And coming to domestic violence, yes, there's a sharp increase in that. I'm not saying it's not so much in India, but it's sharper or at least it's come to light more in the US and Western countries. Two, three reasons they attribute to this is that even married couples are not used to spending 24 bar 7 with each other. So, tutu mein mein to hone wali hai. And tutu mein mein happens in any married couple. If there's passion, there's going to be friction as well. But when it's uh, continuously there, and in people who are living in smaller, cramped surroundings, where when you need your physical space and emotional space, there's nowhere to go because everyone's in that small space, it does result in more of anger and more of uh, frustration being expressed. Not that they care less for the person, but what has come to light also is that a lot of the men who are resorting to violence is because they don't know any better how to channelize their frustration, how they channelize their helplessness. And for that, we do have even counseling helplines, not just for COVID, but for mental health issues. And it is a mental health problem. But So when I used to do training for garment uh, manufacturing uh, companies, uh, CSR initiative, I had told these women, I know, even though they keep beating you and getting drunk, you're often just not willing to walk away because it's a stigma. And for whatever said and done, it is still their family. And create a support system. Know that there are certain triggers that cause that violent breakout. Avoid them. And two things. Most of these violent males are covered. And they will not do it if there are others around. They will not do it if they're going to get exposed. So a very simple thing was when you start hearing noises and there's a cramped uh, accommodation where you know the voices are raised, just go across, knock on the door and ask for some sugar or ask for some atta or some salt. And that breaks that tension. And when there's somebody and you spend two minutes talking, usually the drunk husband has fallen asleep before she gets back in. And it prevents a violent incident. That's not the total answer. It's a much deeper social issue. But it is coming to light more because of the a number of hours that people are spending. Let's all work together to put an end to it by teaching our sons and our younger men to respect all women in their lives. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Neelamak Adambi, for that uh, detailed uh, explanation. So we'll keep the questions coming. So there's a chat box there. So please post your questions out there for Dr. Neelamak. And uh, from what you have said, you know, I wanted to take a point, you know, for uh, on the legal front for Devjani and Abe. So when your turn comes, uh, Devjani and Abe, you could focus on what is the uh, employer's obligation to domestic violence because see this is not uh, on uh, you know uh, on on site where it's not in a factory or in an office and therefore you know the employer or any one of us can say look it's a personal issue but I think it is a community issue it's a societal issue in front of us so when when your time comes we would like you to share on that Devjani and if thank you so much so with that uh, th thank you uh, Dr. Neelima please stay on if you have the time uh, and we would love to hear back from you and I'm sure a lot of us uh, do have questions uh, though you did silence us into submission uh, with your most elaborate uh, experience sharing but uh, some of our members would have something for you thank you so much once again with that uh, you know uh, we would go into a person who is actually advising companies about their workforce okay human capital and for that, we have Anand Rup Ghos. Okay, he's partner human capital at Deloitte. Anand, let's hear from you. Thank you very much. And uh, and thank you, Dr. Nilima, for what you just took us through. Because uh, first of all, yeah, the point on the smile is very important. Um, but I think uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an extremely sobering time for all of us right now. Uh, uh, there is... Uh, for across 
across the length and breadth of organizations in the country, we are all going through a kind of upheaval that I don't think any of us would have ever seen or experienced at all. And uh, uh, and there are different ways that organizations are responding. Uh, uh, so what I wanted to talk about, um, if it is of any use to the audience, is that I'm looking at it from two lenses. One is the lens of me as an employee of a, of a company and what do I expect from my employer and the other is as an, as, a, as, a, as an employer, what are companies doing? And I have uh, Siddharth from, uh, from Zivami who is also doing that job as an employer and he's running that, so, so he can also add to it. But as, a, uh, as an employee today, uh, I think, uh, and, all, and many of you I'm sure are from HR, as an, as an employee, I'm looking at you, I'm looking at my organization and my HR and everybody else to basically help me when I think I have no other, no other avenue for help. I have tried all those multiple mobile phone numbers that have come on WhatsApp. I have tried all the random messages that I have been where I have been told that I will definitely get oxygen or plasma or whatever, and I have not got through any of those numbers. So that's when I turn to my organization to say, can you do something for me? Now from an organization's perspective, and that's, where I, and that's when I uh, look at the other side of the picture, what does the organization do? And from an organization's perspective, um, one thing for sure, and I, and, I, and I think that's true of most organizations, I mean, there will be exceptions for sure in, in everything, but most organizations at this point of time have come through extremely well as, as trying their best to be protective. Uh, and I would say that that's across, the, across organizations that at least we are seeing, people are coming through as, uh, as much as possible to, to protect their employees in as many ways as, as, as they can. Um, it's a very, if you look at the response or if you look at how people are addressing the issue that we are facing right now, it's a very people-led thing. It is not a system-led response. It is not that the infrastructure is coming out and helping us. It is people who are collaborating to help each other. Uh, and uh, so I think, and, that, and that's where organizations are essentially groups of people put into a, some kind of a structure, right? So, and therefore, all of these individuals in their own capacity are trying to help uh, in as much as possible. And I'm seeing the four phases to it. Uh, from an organization's health perspective. One is, first of all, the fact that today, like I described to myself, sitting here right now, um, if I don't have, uh, if I am not infected, if I don't have a problem right now, I'm scared. So my first question is, how do I, how do I manage my fear? And I'm scared and maybe I'm even depressed because I might have heard of other things that are happening to other people. So it's a combination of fear, depression, on top of it, being stuck in one, in, in one place. Some of them, some people stuck in one single bedroom apartment. The, it's not easy, and, and with multiple people possibly around, you are worrying about them. You are getting irritated with them, but you don't have anywhere to go. So, in that kind of an environment, I look at the uh, organizations can basically help in trying to, to the extent possible, provide them with with psychological support in in managing this. Now, the problem with psychological support is that while the organization might offer means for the for an employee to avail that support people don't avail that support because if you look at any psychological helpline the uptake is very low it's always less than 10 percent because who wants to go and tell their employer that i'm actually not as strong as you thought i was when you hired me and i i don't want to accept my weaknesses to, to my employer so that's that's one part so that, that's one thing that you would need to do with the fear and depression and managing that the second is, uh, so I'm so sorry, just to step back, you have the organizations are trying to do that. It is the struggle is that employees are not willing to uh, uh, pick up that, that extent. But wherever there have been successful examples, it's primarily been examples where the scene, and this is not a COVID related example, but these are in general when you see psychological issues being solved, it's when senior leaders themselves come up and say that, look, I had a problem and this is how I solved it. So when leaders stand up and say that I admit their own weaknesses and failures and their own challenges, and then people start opening up as well to some extent. You know. The second is the actual health related solution. And that is where companies obviously are tried the level best. I mean, everybody is ordering concentrators by the by the hundreds of crates from all over the world. There's, there's oxygen cylinders that are being transported around cities. There are people who are coordinating ambulances, hospital beds. People are calling friends, contacts. All of that. Now, this is everybody is trying to manage within the available infrastructure, and everybody knows it is difficult to do that. So, I think what companies are doing is that they're putting the infrastructure in as much as possible to try and help. And here, and I can say that from my own personal experience, we are we are trying to like as a firm, Deloitte has a lot of people who are not currently in the mid metro cities, who are not in the Bangalore, Hyderabad, Delhi, and so on, but who are sitting in really far off locations, um, distributed like three people in one small town in UP. 
and when they come back with questions or when they come back asking for help these are situations when you realize that you cannot do anything about it like people are coming back and and saying in my town the doctors have basically said don't come to me to the 15th of may even whatever you might have. i i don't have time to treat you so there's someone who's sitting there basically pleading to say can i get a test done so you have these kinds of situations and and to the extent possible organizations i think today are like i said they're trying their best to send concentrators around the country to do tie ups with other people who can help in far off locations or even in bigger cities and so on and so forth but there's only that much you can do the important thing is post the immediate health management the immediate health management like i said is an infrastructure question companies by themselves cannot solve the entire 100% what companies can do is what happens next so what happens next is there are two kinds of people one who will come out of it absolutely fine and that's the large population that's probably 98% of everybody will come out of it feeling absolutely fine and will go ahead with life but the scars will remain the fears will remain the tension will remain the worry about the vaccine will remain and that's where the companies can have a larger role to play in again psychologically and through vaccine support etc etc be able to get them back to feel normal again and then the other that's the challenge the, the places where there have been fatalities and i would say if i look at the second wave broadly across organizations it's about 2% So, and large organizations, small organizations obviously might not be as many, but larger organizations is about two percent. And what do you do in in order for you to be a better employer in how you deal with it after something has happened to your employee? How do you help the family? How do you help the the the, the children, the the spouse, and so on and so forth? And that's where organizations can come up in a very very significant way in trying to help people. And people are in, in extending life insurance covers. People are providing. Uh, Uh, uh support in terms of for at least at certain levels of uh, of your organizational hierarchy people are offering jobs like the typical government thing that used to happen that your next of kin will get a job here and so on so we were doing that um offering education support to start to your two kids for a prolonged period of time and so on so like i said the, the organizations are humans so everybody understands everybody feels it at their own at the very personal level as well this is not a this is not a war situation where there's someone else fighting some war somewhere else. this is a very very personal situation and in that sense organizations are being human beings as well and and i think that all of the responses is on account of that but my uh, my closing point to everybody here who is attending this call is that uh, uh, is that while uh, there's a huge infection there's huge amount of uh, actual physical damage that's happening to people um, the mental damage is about next that and it's important for us to be able to help people around us to come out of that mental damage it is it is either through, through people that have impacted in their families or just plain fear and that's important for all of us to manage and that's it thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to be here back to your business thank you anand i have a couple of thoughts that i will uh, you know post to you uh, you know uh, among your clients as well as in deloitte you know uh, we see employees have different needs now for example vaccine okay vaccine is in short supply what are we doing to make sure that employees and their dependents have the vaccine okay that is one cost of the vaccine is or organizations uh, supplementing it or are they doing it free the second question related to that is you know with some folks who could be infected the cost is very high though we know that the government is has covid hospitals and things like that the cost of this is very high and employees don't have so much of money at their disposal are organizations providing loans or grants or any such thing uh, for employees these are the two thoughts i thought we can uh, hear you thanks I'll take take the first on vaccine. Vaccine is, is unfortunately it is a. So actually, both your questions have the same answer. It is subject to the size of the organization. Unfortunately, if I am a massive organization with hundred thousand people in India, five hundred thousand people in India, with that kind of a balance sheet, I can do a lot more. I can do tie ups with Serum Institute or Covi Covi Covi. Uh, sorry, Covaxin, and and be able to uh, procure vaccines for my people. organize distribution do all of that but if i am 200 people if i am and i know uh, uh, whether is is representing that set of employees who probably have a smaller employee base who don't have those massive size and you'll probably best suited to answer this question but where organizations are smaller there it is a bigger challenge and then so so i can i'll 
if I'm a big organization, I will do something. And I'm pretty certain that by early June, you will see most large organizations have managed some form of vaccination program for their employees. Small organizations are not so sure. Um, less influential organizations. Small organizations could also still be influential. Less influential organizations are not so sure. The second is on your uh, support with regard to someone who's affected. Again, it's a balance sheet question. For a large organization, you will find large organizations buying concentrators, like I said, hundreds of thousands of people. facilities are being provided, etc. It's all over the place. I mean, it, it's all, all sorts of support being provided. Small organizations, you have the balance sheet coming in, in the way of being able to provide that support. Look, I, I think the simple answer is that if the purse permits, I think organizations are not stepping back from releasing that money. But where the purse does not permit, then there's only so much that you can do. Remember that we all used to say that after COVID, there'll be a K-shaped curve. This is the actual K-shaped curve in action. The have haves will keep going up, the have nots will keep Slightly. Thank you so much, uh, Anand. So we'll come back to you. I'm sure our members have some questions for you. Thank you so much once again for that deep insight and uh, practices across the industry and your own company too. Uh, with that, uh, we are going into uh, a company called Zavame and we have uh, Siddharth Vishwanath from there. He's the head, head of HR and uh, Zavame also has uh, its uh, presence in the retail space. Uh, apart from, you know, revolutionizing, uh, you know, lingerie in India and uh, also being one of the largest uh, or fastest growing startups to a unicorn uh, state. So with that, uh, Siddharth Vishwanath, uh, can you share your experiences, please? Thank you. Thank you, Augustus, for the introduction. Yes, uh, so I head HR for uh, Zivame. Uh, we are uh, both an e-commerce company and a retail organization. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, we are also a brand of uh, lingerie intimate wear, like Augustus said. Uh, I would, from my perspective or from my experiences, uh, like Anand said, I'd, I'd want to just share um, what we are doing as an organization and what we see some other peer organizations doing as well. So, uh, you know, we, we actually went back to work a couple of times uh, a week uh, during Jan and Feb when it was safer. Uh, and, uh, uh, and as soon as you know the spike started coming in, we were, we went back to you know being conservative for our employees' health, and we said employee safety first. Let's go back to working from home. We were one of those organizations that you know was a little shy of work from home earlier because of our our, our growth rate and our speed of growth, but we embraced it, and we're happy to say that you know that that worked for us now. Uh, having said that. Uh, right, and like Anand beautifully said, uh, organizations are nothing but a group of people who are bound together by some kind of a construct, right? Uh, and it's not the organizations that are coming together, it's the people who are in the organization who are coming together to help. So one of the things that we have done on the ground is a kind of a, a task force. So task force sounds very, very important, but it's just a group of people who said, hey, I will come together uh, along with my day job to do whatever it is that we can for our team. So what we have done is we have spread the word across to say that, hey, if you as an employee or somebody who lives with you or a family member, an extended family member, a cousin, whoever is living with you or is in touch with you is infected or ha is having symptoms, it does need some help. Uh, just let us know, right? Uh, and then this task force would then reach out to them every single day in the morning to make sure that we capture what the situation is and in their household, uh, in, including uh, if required, giving e-consultations, making doctors available for uh, you know a, a second consultation uh, through our network, through our uh, through other some other partnerships. Uh, uh, we have we have made uh, medicine deliveries possible to some places without looking at cost. Uh, we have made medicine deliveries across cities, across states uh, possible because a particular drug was available in a particular city and uh, somebody needed it urgently in a critical scenario in a different state. Uh, we used our kind of supply chain to do that. Uh, we've, we have helped people identify where hospital beds may be available, etc. But like Anand said, the challenge here is uh, not how much we can provide, it's also uh, the stigma of the employees or that our team members trying to tell us that they have a problem, right? So people don't normally come forward and say that they are infected or their families are infected until they have a symptom or until they have a need 
un until which time it is it, it's quite late. So what we are doing is our leaders on an everyday basis reach out to their teams to ask how they're doing, how their families are doing and what support they require. And then a lot of that information comes through that network and not necessarily through the employee. And a lot of the cases where we've been able to help out are cases where we were able to identify the situation early on and able to provide help early on before it became critical. Right now, having said this, uh, you know, a lot of us, including myself, uh, are, are working from home, but uh, for us, uh, our retail folks, people who run our stores, and people, and because we run e-commerce and e-commerce is still working, uh, people who run our warehouses, our distribution centers, uh, they don't necessarily have that uh, that leeway, right? So uh, they are still working from uh, from from their offices. We have our QA teams who are working from our contract manufactured uh, factories. They are still working from factories wherever it is working, right? So what can we do? to make sure that when they are working, that they are absolutely 100% safe. And we've had to change our SOPs at our retail, our ways of working, ways of sales, ways of reaching out to customers, our protocols, everything from the ground up uh, to make sure that uh, these protocols now include the uh, COVID protocol. So uh, if, if it includes double masking, providing them with a uh, mask, providing them with uh, uh, supplements, like uh, Dr. Nilima said, uh, pro providing them with supplements to boost their immunity, face shields, sanitizers, whatever is required, right? Uh, in as much quantity, irrespective of the cost. That is something that we are doing as an organization. And we see a lot of our peer organizations in the industry also doing that. But most of all, we find that um, uh, our, our peers in this, uh, uh, our team members in this area of work uh, lack the education and the training that we get through multiple networks on WhatsApp. Uh, uh, there's a lot of misinformation on WhatsApp, but we do get a lot of information through websites, etc. because we have the means uh, and some of these team members may not. And so a, a lot of our effort is actually on training educating, retraining, re-educating them as we hear and more and more. Another point about vaccination as well, Augustus. So as an organization, we are uh, reimbursing uh, vaccination costs for all our employees and all our uh, extended uh, family as well. So our, our entire dependent uh, base as well. Uh, and I know that a lot of our uh, peers in the industry are also doing this uh, full reimbursement for the entire family. And uh, like Anand said, the organizations which are much larger in size and have the wherewithal are also helping uh, identify opportunities to vaccinate their employees in their own way. Uh, in terms of financial assistance, uh, you know uh, why we don't have a policy change uh, that has happened yet, but wherever a, 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 an employee reaches out uh, saying that they need help, there's an urgent hospitalization. Unfortunately, we've had cases where people have reached out for money for last rites, etc. Uh, we kind of just do away with policies, we do away with processes of uh, approvals, etc., and just kind of take the shortest path to uh, helping the employee. And unfortunately, that's happened in a couple of cases where we've been able to help with uh, with, with that and salary advances, etc. And uh, in terms of insurance, uh, our, uh, we made sure that our insurance covers uh, COVID uh, for dependents as well. More than any of this, I think what is really helping uh, the, the the spirit of positivity is. Uh, is just kind of engaging with our employees as much as we can in terms of, you know, uh, talking about health or, or diet or, uh, or yoga or, you know, mental wellness. And some of our partners, uh, including our, our insurance, etc., are helping us uh, create this content. So that's helping. Um, and I'll, I'll end it by saying that all of this is, um, you know, completely dependent on that information coming in on that help is required, right? Uh, and so vulnerability from leaders and leaders reaching out to their team members to ask on an everyday basis how they are doing and how how we can help them uh, right both physically mentally uh, is what uh, we seem to be doing it's, it seems to be helping us our peers seem to be doing and they seem to be helping them as well I, i'll end it at that and we'll see if any questions come by thank you so much uh Sid. Uh, and you know what you have uh, done is typically there's something called the duty of care you know which an employer is supposed to do okay and that is basic stuff right in terms of wellness well-being you know do they have the right equipment to be productive you know so you you've done that so uh, this definitely costed money and all that and you know sometimes uh, like you said you went uh, 
over and beyond policy and said, OK, this is a humanitarian need. We will do it. So what role did CSR funding play here? Did you dip into your CSR? Is there a way that uh, you were able to? Because I know now that you know COVID care centers can be covered under CSR funding. Did you dip into that, or or you uh, or you're mulling over it? No, we haven't uh, depended on that. We I, I don't think that's a thought as well uh, at this point. We are just uh, you just focused on our employees and their health at this time. Uh, where that funds are going to come from, what we're going to account it as. Uh, is it's not a thought that uh, has crossed our mind at this time. We are more focused on helping our employees at this time. So sure. thank you yeah. so much. In fact, our our uh, legal colleagues will also uh, throw some light on that as we go further. Thank you so much, Sid. We'll come back to you. I'm sure there are some questions. And uh, you know, uh, during this time, one one more thing that uh, comes to the fore is uh, employees. You know, irrespective of the sector that they come from or what level they are in the organization, given that India has a young workforce. Therefore, the savings is not so high. OK, the saving for a rainy day because their their age threshold is so low. All right. And for this uh, situation that people are faced with COVID, there is a big financial burden. And also, uh, do you do employees have the right uh, insurance coverage? Maybe the employer provides something, but over and above it, do they need additional insurance coverage? Do they have enough savings? Uh, some employers have also gone and tied up with banks to provide employees uh, overdraft facility. Some have given grants, some have given loans, and the financial well being has not been so much more important than it is now. And, uh, you know, uh, Anushet. Um, Good friend, you know, she is so passionate about this and I said, Anu, you have to share with us, you know, the practices among your clients and what you are able to advise as a financial wellness expert. Thank you, Anu. Thanks, uh, Augustus. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yes. Uh, thanks for all those kind words and thanks for setting the platform for what is one of the most important uh, aspects to wellness and well-being in uh, the current times as well as the coming future uh, for the last over the last couple of years we know that corporates have been focusing on employee health and wellness issues and now it's kind of um, well settled in all our employer uh, charters as well as employees that you need to eat healthy food and canteens are catering to that Exercise is an important aspect. So physical well-being is an e equally important aspect. Most of our um, large, especially the large organizations, have gym facilities and all the other physical uh, workout facilities. But an important aspect which is missing in this whole, uh, whole wheel of uh, financial wellness is uh, wheel of wellness is the financial wellness aspect, which is so much. Uh, it is more like a key driving factor towards what uh, towards the well-being of every individual and every household so it can no longer be ignored so just to share uh, the situation as it was before covid um, there there was a survey conducted by pwc there have been surveys conducted by uh, wills watson which uh, these are very credible agencies and they said that about 38% of our work, workforce is underprepared for any kind of disaster. Now put that in perspective with how COVID has played, played out in terms of uncertainties, be it job loss, be it change of um, location, and there has been loss, a loss both in terms of lives as well as livelihood. So we feel that this whole thing is going to have a very strong financial impact on um, our uh, workforce itself. Couple that with the kind of mental stress they are going through and living in the sense of fear and anxiety for nearly a year and a half. Um, as we prepare for COVID and the current situation, we have divided this um, whole subject for myself into two parts. What is it that we can do right now to protect ourselves financially? And what is it that we need to be prepared for in future so that we have um, a financially stable uh, workforce, which would then be able to contribute uh, towards our productivity as we come back from this wave. 
so we can see that you know there has been a great impact right now nobody most of the large organizations are not focusing on productivity right now we are all speaking about taking care of our employees and uh, what more can one ask you know if employers look at their employees with empathy i think having that listening ear is the most important um, tool that an employer can provide uh having said that just taking from what my uh, what the earlier speakers brought into focus is that employees don't feel confident of having an open conversation forget about me, uh, physical and uh, medical issues if they don't get in address you can easily imagine that financial issues definitely don't come onto the table unless it reaches a situation like an emergency as uh, siddharth was sharing earlier so uh, how does one make uh, this kind of platform with it the organization where sharing money issues or bringing out or speaking about finances is no longer a taboo so uh, some of the things uh, we've seen in the financial awareness programs we've been doing across the cadre with the young employees who come in who uh, we do not uh, have any kind of formal education in terms of how do we manage our finances so the workforce just enters and of course consumerism is there so they just keep um, uh, buying and easy loans are available credit cards is very easy to use e-commerce of course is there so um, there is this rampant debt trap that we are creating for ourselves as well as the country and we feel that awareness is the key to change so we find that more enduring most of our programs if we speak to them on stargazing into the near short term future as well as long term future we are able to detect that they are making a positive change in terms of their spending habits in terms of their saving behaviors now another thing that uh, we've been focusing in the awareness programs is to always have a sufficient emergency fund which should be about 3 to 6 months but 3 uh, to 6 months of your expenses but you will be a uh, very surprised to know that only about 50% of the people are prepared to handle an emergency and right now with covid where the whole family uh, reaches an uh, like you know the whole unit sometimes needs emergency care we are really dipping heavily into the insurances that we have most of our workforce depends on the employers uh, health insurance policies to uh, help them tide through any of these crises so i would urge all employers to go back and revisit those and see if through a group insurance they can be uh, improvised the cover can be increased as well as reach out to their employees to uh, to get a top up or a super top up done based on their dependents based on their needs so that you know even though this is a uh, middle of the year and there would be insurance policy renewals but this can be done if it is done in a timely manner we will be able to provide some kind of uh, assistance towards the financial needs for healthcare um that is there the other thing that we um uh, we are finding and we did this uh, throughout our uh, covid sessions in the last year was that have have all the employees updated their records because families are undergoing structural changes so ensure that the nominees are updated ensure that the new uh, new babies who've been born in the country are updated along with their employee database so uh, for example uh, like you know um, i was reading um, a recent survey and a statistics which said that india is one of the uh, leading nations in terms of number of children born in this covid year and only on 1st of january 2021 60000 babies have been born now if these people these children don't get enrolled as part of your family insurance get updated they may be left in for a lurch even in the future so uh, some of those ensuring that salary continuity is maintained either through a uh, through uh, giving salaries twice a month or some this is a very prevalent method in the uae where salaries are disbursed twice a, twice a month just to help uh, employees sail through so those are some of the policy changes that employers can look at look at um along with the kind of assistance that we've heard from uh, both anand and siddharth that um, uh, you guys are providing and trying to make it easier for the employee employees 
the other thing organizations i think we need to take note of is how do we create a stable workforce when they come back because once we are set through with the second wave and the third wave we need to get back and get our productivity back to the previous levels get back to that momentum that uh, the country was in in the last uh, few years so to ensure that again a financial stability would be one of the uh, most important things and productivity uh, impact of financial stress is extremely high it is one of the leading reasons of divorce leading reasons of reduc reduced productivity so awareness programs which are done keeping your employees in mind keeping the individual in mind uh, go a long way because you know uh, we all do a lot of haphazard in investing you whatever is coming your way you just go and buy it based on either a tax um, uh, tax saving requirement or whatever so just doing a 360 degree plan which uh, which ensures that your current needs of insurance and emergency fund is met as well as your long term needs or whatever goals that you may have whether it is child care whether it is parental care whether it is grandparents looking after the children or any uh, end of life kind of situations along are being met so all that needs to be discussed and all uh, that can be done easily through awareness programs which are uh, tailor made for the audiences and not necessarily coming through by pushing uh, pushing a product uh, by to your employee that way um the other thing is how do we set up uh, a platform where families are having a discussion about family continuity so uh, more and more um, i would encourage leader leaderships are taking note of this and you know uh, teams are opening up to having open conversation about this Uh, because very often, uh, especially COVID, has made it easier for us to have these conversations. Uh, because when you have a family uh, continuity plan, where what have you invested? Where what are the terms? What happens? Let's say the breadwinner goes in for a COVID. Does the is the family aware of where it can uh, draw the funds from? What the finances are? What is the what is the action plan that they need to take care of? in case there is a uncertain situation that they are, they are left with so, so those kind of conversations are very very important the other important aspect and uh, that would be my last point but one of the most significant points is to ensure that the nominees are updated in your epfs ensure that nominees are updated in all your financial instruments um try and write out a small will in case um, you have uh, more assets and talk about how you want this whole uh, whatever wealth or whatever money or whatever financial situation that you are in should be handled um post or should be handled by the family unit just in case things go untoward and i do not mean that sometimes the person is in the hospital and you the family needs to withdraw from their bank account but you don't have a mechanism as yet uh, where it it is possible so uh, you know we could come up with uh, and this would again need a lot of support on the policy front where you could do power of attorneys where your spouses can uh, withdraw from your bank account or children need to know about that um and build in uh, or maybe go and change your bank accounts to joint holdings so that more than one person is aware of even within the uh, organization it would be great if uh, more than one uh, if employees more than interact with more than one um, team member and they they know about the families as well as have the coordinates of the families so that you know help can be um, can be processed and can be extended in a more beneficial manner uh, so those are some of the thoughts that we bring in during um, any financial awareness programs and uh, once these key structures of protect how to protect your current self how to plan for the future how to take care of transmission and how to build wealth these things are taken care of i think a whole lot of um, financial stress is uh, is taken away from um, from the individual and that helps them perform better and i think those would be some of the key tools in preparing our workforce for for what is to come in the next few years
yeah, Augustus, I'll be happy to take any questions that uh, you may have. Thank you uh, so much, Anu. Yeah, uh, you know, financial wellness is uh, top of the table now. It's on the front burner. And also, you know, a uh, lot of hospitals, you know, which uh, were, uh, you know, supposed to honor cashless, uh, started yeah. demanding cash from employees. So we, we started getting calls from people saying that, look, I don't have so much of money, you know, to put fr up front. So uh, there was uh, also this breakdown, right, uh, where uh, hospitals started demanding things and various other healthcare things. So yes, financial wellness and uh, uh, also improving on the insurance uh, cap. The other thing that came to fore, uh, Anu, was, um, you know, the in extreme cases where there was a loss of life, uh, the family definitely didn't know, you know, how to go about it. All right. How to go and claim some of those things that they were entitled to uh, as the next of kin. So, that, yes, that is something we'll come back to. You have to tell us, you know, what are those things that people need to list out? Sadly, we'll have to keep this ready. But I think it's a very important aspect so that people are not uh, push from pillar to post in situations like this. So with that, uh, you know, I will go to Vaidhi. You know, Vaidhi and I, we were talking some time ago, and he's so busy, uh, you know, in the startup world, because startup, there is just no stop. Uh, and apparently, uh, you know, he took his vaccine and went straight to work, okay, belying all those medical uh, advices. So nevertheless, uh, Vaidhi also has a passion about clean air and quality of air. Uh, and that's something he's going to talk about too. He is uh, the MD uh, and founder of PAQX. And uh, we'll let Vaidhi speak a little bit more about himself and what he's doing in the SME and startup space. Thank you. Uh, thanks, um, Augustus. Thanks, BCAC. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Good. Uh, thank you all, um, uh, fellow panelists. It's uh, great. It's been great hearing each one of you. Let me do a quick intro of myself. I am Vaidyanathan, engineer, master's from IIM, and I'm a serial entrepreneur. I'm a technocrat, domain of exp expertise or is product design, clean air, and wellness. The name of my company is Personal Air Quality Systems. So we all know COVID is an airborne disease. Air has become extraordinarily important. When I say personal air, the bubble around us has become even more important. All of us are wearing masks. OK, so I'll talk about that a little later. Uh, as uh, the moderator mentioned, we are a startup. So I'll try to structure my part of the talk under three sections. One is the startup, the small companies challenge one. Second is the ecosystem, the bank supporting institutions. Can they do a little more? Third, definitely I'll try and share a little thoughts on the air that we inhale and the environment, because that could be some useful takeaway for each one of you. OK, when I try to talk about a startup, our company, we are an IoT solutions company end-to-end -end solutions we have. So I have design team, hardware, software, analytics, finance, admin, the full set of team. And of course, we are under 30 in terms of numbers. And uh, not only under 30 in terms of numbers, the average age is also 24, 25. All of them are youngsters. I, I, try, uh, I think I'm the guy who lifts up the average in my company. And uh, the interesting thing was, uh, when COVID one happened, um, when we did a survey among our uh, employees, their biggest apprehension, um, it was one of uh, the fear. That is, uh, what would you, because most of my boys, girls had come from Patna, Belgavi, Goa, Chera in Kerala, Salem in Tamil Nadu, Mangalore, Belgavi, and such places. So they had lived the parents and come over here. They were staying in PG accommodation. So the biggest fear was handling themselves alone. So in a manner of speaking, as a product company and in the domain of air, we could get the relevant permissions. And we never were closed for a single day last year through now. So very often I found the boys uh, and the girls were needing that security about how they can handle and such. So we started doing certain practices which can be conducive, like uh, right in the beginning, Dr. Nilima talked about 
the need for doing pranayama type of uh, exercise to increase the lung capacity and be aware of it. So one of the practices that we started, which we continue even now when we work remote from homes and stuff like that is, every morning when the entire team assembles, all of us practice breathing exercises for 20 minutes. Pranayama. You can call it pranayama, you can call it breathing exercise without getting a religious touch, but every morning, 20 minutes, we do pranayama. Right now, most of the team is working from various places in the country. 9.30 sharp, we log in, we do this. And uh, this time, COVID-2, one another thing I've seen, that is the sense of fear has gone up among the boys and the girls, because every community they've seen somebody impacted, cousin impacted, or an uncle in serious condition and such. So this particular thing called for a different type of, uh, again, a treatment, if I may say. So post the pranayama, we have a five-minute prayer session. Pray for the well-being of each one of us, relatives, friends, and the extended community. This is received very, very well by the team. I mean, when I try to tell this for my company, it may look very uh, different for you. You're, you're all likely to be large corporates, but I believe you can practice at a department level. Uh, I Then the third thing I found it very interesting, when we are suddenly distributed team, instead of being in one office, uh, the hardware people are in the office, software, everybody's outside. When the people are uh, distributed in far and away, the third thing we try to create is a community chat type of a session. I mean, every meeting doesn't have to be formal, serious meeting. So typically what we do is one day of the week, one hour. I mean, sometimes I try to say, I'll, I'll come, initiate it, and I step out so that they can comfortably, easily pour their heart and talk out. You know, you call it catharsis, you call it bouncing it, crying on somebody's shoulder, call it by any psychological term. But I find that a very, very nice therapy where people are very happy chatting with peers and colleagues about operational problems, the day-to-day -day tensions and such. So uh, last, in terms of the people issue, if I might try to say, is uh, in a startup, for example, in a small company, you may not see uh, the a big office, security, somebody to open the office and such. One thing we did was anybody could come to, the, we trusted everybody, period. We trusted everybody. We told, <coughs> handle it like a bio bubble. Be safe, come by your independent vehicle. If you're not comfortable, stay at home. We gave them the freedom. I repeat it, we gave them the freedom and trusted. Anybody could come in the office, work. The only promise was if I would come to office, I am promising that I am. I believe I am safe. I can come and work here. So when we repose trust and faith in the boys and the girls, of course, I'm using boys as a unigender, please. Um, I found the motivation, conviction to work fantastic. The good thing is we have not defaulted on any supply. Our customers, you know, we are an IoT solutions company not one service delivery to customer was impacted. So the credit goes to the team, the boys and the girls, incredibly motivated. We just needed to create an ambience environment where they could feel a little more secure. That's in terms of the first portion, if I may say. The second portion, with the permission of the chair, if I may like to talk, is about SMEs, the issues. It's unfortunate, you see, um, uh, our Delight colleague told about the key type of a growth. That's a big truth in that. The way MSMEs are hit is unfortunate. Nobody is in the position to care. The banking as an ecosystem is geared for the well-to-do, moneyed people. The SMEs and the MSMEs, the way they are hit, the way their employers are hit, and of course, uh, um, extended contract laborers if they are hit is unfortunate. We, uh, whether it is BCIC or a CII or the government of India, need to create softer loans, you know, extending the uh, 
facilities for MSMEs, carte blanche, without asking questions. You see, because airline industry as a billion dollar industry, hotel industry as a, you know, 50,000 crore industry does get the funding. MSMEs, can the government say all MSMEs under 5 crores, no questions asked, your CC, cash credit limit is doubled. Please do that. They don't do that. The only benefit they give is 7.5% once, and the second time a small benefit coming to a total of 20%. I mean, the why it hurts the MSMEs more is the moment there was a bit of a choke in the system, the biggest of the corporates, I mean, I don't want to take names, we deal with the best of the names, whether it is IT or infra or uh, the you know service delivery integrators unfortunate the payments did get choked that help that hit the last mile msmes tremendously so i think there is a need for a discussion in this forum and more forums government should just take a carte blanche call that all msmes working with banks increase the limit double it because they are as long as they have survived first wave they have survived second wave they have survived and come up to this why not they do that so that is the second portion of what I wanted to talk. Uh, we can go on and on, but I, the third point I wish to talk is about air. Um, with your permission, there is a, I am a multiple patent holder in this domain, so I'm taking the liberty of sharing a few thoughts. Uh, all of, you see, now it's sort of reasonably conclusively evidence has come about the airborne transmission of COVID virus. This, when we make a statement, there can be a panic. But then we should not be unnecessarily panic stricken. We need to address it objectively. Some of the small input points I may like to share are these. Like, for example, just the way you know, the COVID virus also requires a carrier. Air becomes a medium for it to get conveyed. And of course, we've been reading about surfaces, need to clean and all. That is because while we talk, there could be small little droplets, or when we sneeze or cough, there could be droplets which can carry a virus, since we talked of cleaning the surface. Mask is a terrific way to try and protect, so that I ensure that when I cough or whatever it is, there is no droplet that comes out. The second important component would be indoor air. We all have got used to a conditioned, good indoor environment, which is fine. Temperature is good. But what the air conditioning conditioned environment does is it takes a room air, recirculates it, recirculates it, cools it, and recirculates it. So because of that, what happens is if there is one person infected, the same air tends to keep getting multiplied. So one of the simpler techniques for each one of us to follow would be diluting the room air. In India, many of the offices have ventilation, non-EC offices, so fresh air is a good one. If it's an air-conditioned office, please ensure every hour you flush out the stale air in the room. I mean, it's a complicated subject in terms of central air conditioning in such places. Please instruct your facility manager to pump in more fresh air than normal. That way you will tend to dilute the air. Third important point is when you talk up, when you go in a car or when you are at home, even if it is two people in the same room, please ensure you retain the windows open so that the air gets diluted. We think that uh, you know we uh, we all get carried away when the air conditioning companies advertise stating that uh, I have a filter that protects it up to 99.9 percent. .9%. Yes, they do. 99.9% .9 of the particles, particulate matter they protect, but virus, bacteria, viruses and bacteria come in the 0.01%. Okay, so please ensure that you have more fresh air, diluting the room air. Doesn't matter if the temperature is a little high, you're going to sweat, but then you're going to be safe and sure. So I would like to wish you all healthy tidings over the next few months. Let us all come out winners. We all have done fantastically trying to take care of our respective employees and the society. Let's continue, sirs. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you so much, uh, Vaidinathan. That was good. I, I, the point that struck me, you know, was uh, the value system that you brought in, right? Where you said, okay, we trust you to come in or to work at home, right? That value system comes out of freedom. 
uh, once you're more free, you know, then you collaborate and then you innovate, you know. So, so basically, these are the things, you know, that uh, make startups what they are today. But thank you one, once again so much, Vaidhi. And we'll come back to you, you know, that, that thing about the air conditioner. Now you got me thinking, all right? So I, I uh, also you. need to, at this point, uh, welcome two of our um, uh, mentors to the HR uh, Expert Committee and the Women's uh, Empowerment and Leadership. So I'm happy to see both Mr. B.C. Prabhakar as well as Mr. Parameshwaran uh, on this meeting. Thank you so much for being there, sirs. Uh, and uh, towards the end, we would definitely love to hear from you. Uh, and as we go further, um, we would uh, hear from the education sector. All right, and uh, we have Dr. Anupama Malagi, and Dr. Anupama is professor at the RV Institute of Management. And uh, Dr. Anupama, please do share with us uh, what you have been doing in your sector. Thanks. Yes, thank you, Augustus. And it's fantastic being on this panel to talk about uh, how exactly different sectors have been impacted by this particular pandemic now. Coming from the education sector, we do have very, very uh, specific and unique challenges that we have faced. So I think to start off on a positive note, I thought, let me uh, quote what uh, Mr. Parashuraman was telling in the beginning, every struggle, there is greater learning. So with that, you know, we had never imagined uh, sometime a few years back that education sector could also go online on the virtual mode completely wherein we have the opportunity to work from home so this is something which has come as a superb learning for all of us where we have been transitioning into this online or a virtual mode quite seamlessly see though if we look at the overall scenario the situation appears a little grim where we are talking about uh, schools and colleges being closed since March 2020. So since then, you know, around 900 universities, 40,000 colleges, and about 11,000 standalone institutions being closed, you know, we have seen that it has been affecting a large part of students, around 37 million students have been affected by this. Nevertheless, we have to, uh, that's what, as I said, every struggle, we have a great learning happening, and that is where even the new education policy, which was brought out in the uh, 2020 July, has, you know, they have emphasized on blended learning. So now when you're talking about blended learning, that is seamlessly integrating uh, online learning with the traditional methodology, how prepared, how ready are we for this particular uh, scenario? Is that what we are looking at? So now, what what is it that we need to look at we have to you know kind of rework on the existing pedagogical methods we have to kind of uh, rework on the delivery mode of delivery and then see how equipped we are to have a complete set of teaching learning and evaluation happening online so this is where you know we have to have the kind of necessary infrastructure the necessary kind of support system, uh, you know, by way of edtech solutions, which are coming out with a lot of feasible and implementable solutions to make this uh, transition happen quite seamlessly and quite smoothly. So here, if we have to talk about our own uh, organization, you know, the, the, I could uh, confidently say that the transition has happened quite um, seamlessly where you know we have really had a lot of higher engagement with the students we have had that kind of uh, connect where learning has not stopped all through so that is where uh, the online resources the e resources have been given access to and this is something where we are also getting to learn the nuances we are also getting to learn the kind of uh, you know different techniques or tools where the effectiveness can be enhanced. So that is one thing. So, you know, there are a lot of these online um, resources available for the students, whether it is accessing the library, we have provided them a whole lot of, uh, you know, ebooks. There is a plethora of e resources that um, all of us have access to. So, that is something which is 
on the brighter side where we say that yes uh, we have been able to come up with kind of feasible solutions and more important like uh, dr nilima was mentioning in the beginning everybody is undergoing a lot of stress whether it is the teaching fraternity or whether it is the students so either side there has been a lot of stress and for that you know we thought we have these virtual mentoring sessions so this unique practice of mentoring has been working really well and that is where i would definitely like to say that this on a virtual mentoring sessions have really uh, helped students to tide over their stress and you know the kind of difficulties that they are facing they they, they would uh, want someone to listen to so that was very nicely brought out when uh, dr nilima was speaking about the kind of stress that every sector has been going through and moving a step ahead we also have these kind of uh, sessions with the psychological counselor if students feel that they need to uh, you know get their issues addressed by a counselor you know if at all there are any other psychological issues when uh, going through this uh, phase that also is being facilitated so like this you know we have had quite a lot of um, things wherein we thought yes learning should not stop and because we are the ones who are uh, trying to develop that you know in a holistic way the skills that will drive the students employability which will further impact their productivity so health and well being all these things have been put in a nutshell and that is what we have been able to do this because the challenges faced by education sector is very very unique uh, if we look at this uh, transitioning into online education some of us some of the educations have been able to do it quite well but not not everyone has the access you know there are connectivity issues not all the remote parts of the country are still covered by the internet and uh, these kind of infrastructure facilities so that is still a challenge but still in spite of all that in spite of all the you know there are certain ways in which we are able to come up with because this is where we have these edtech solutions which are coming to our rescue you know conducting exams online because health of the students has to be on top most priority so there keeping that in mind we have the conducting of examinations which happens online the proctored exams that are being conducted for the students that kind of ensures and also gives the students the kind the real uh, time uh, scenario where they are writing the exams so these are some of the things you know some of the challenges that we have been facing and more or less we are trying to overcome all these challenges because it is again a new learning because uh, this is like never before we have never uh, looked at education sector which can happen completely online because uh, we we had uh, not imagined that this situation would arise so now kind of that learning and kind of that comfort zone has come in so i think i am happy to say that yes even though in spite of this kind of a situation the uh, the facilities have been extended in quite a seamless manner and uh, learning is continuing so i think we would have some more questions coming in later on yes thank you augustus thank you so much uh, doctor yes. and uh, always a pleasure listening to you you know uh, this blended learning is is definitely out there you know and with everything digital but also you know um, maybe uh, at another time we could discuss it for a paucity of time is that the cost of education coming down because uh, one uh, school of thought is that you know you're uh, saving a lot on infrastructure and electricity and so many other things and maintenance and therefore the cost should uh, come down but i know that uh, that is a, a different discussion but i just thought i will just uh, socialize it here because i'm sure a lot of people are looking at more and more affordable education uh, yes. and better education which is more affordable you know with foreign tie ups and so on and so forth but we'll come back to you if there is time thanks you so much uh, yes. doctor Thank and uh, with that we will go to our legal uh, luminaires and uh, 
Devjani, uh, Devjani is here. Uh, Devjani um, is a partner at Kocher and Co. And uh, know her as a very um, <clears throat> interesting lawyer, especially in the labor law space where we've done some work uh, in the past with the chamber. Uh, nice knowing you, Devjani, and do share with us, Devjani. Thank you so much, Augie. Um, I know we're running really late right now, so I'm going to literally stick to five minutes. And um, I'm going to touch upon a few topics that have come through, things have been, that have been interesting that the speakers have also mentioned. I think that if Abe has time, he can pick the rest of them up. What I wanted to talk about were uh, three main aspects, mental health, which Dr. Nilima spoke about, financial issues, which Anu spoke about, and then overall, from the HR perspective that Sid and Anand spoke about, which are uh, initiatives, employee outreach initiatives, from a legal perspective. See, what I've been facing the last, when we hit, when we got wave one, it was very, nobody was prepared. The government wasn't prepared, no laws covered a, a remote working situation. So when wave one hit India, we were dealing with regulatory issues with the government flip-flopping every single day, however well-meaning it must have been. But there were questions coming in, how do we do this, how do we sort it out? And then things kind of settled down. Employers realized that the hybrid working model was working. Um, things were moving, you know, you know, policy changes took place. Then wave two hit and then the demands have changed immediately. Ever since February 2021, I would say the first quarter of 2021, when we saw the numbers increasing, mental health came to a forefront. And I wanted to share what, you know, some of my clients have done. I think that might be beneficial for the group. While we have the employee assistance program in place, which has been a part and parcel of many companies for a long time, what they've now done is ramped it up. They have now made mental health care a priority. We are in Mental Health Awareness Month. So that has definitely been amped up. As both Sid and Anand mentioned, leaders, senior team leaders, managers being more sensitized to mental health issues. That is another aspect that needs to that has come up. Timing, work time, the lines between work from home and personal time off have blurred. Now, from a legal perspective, we're looking at the fact that most shops and establishment, act, establishment acts have prescribed working hours. But when you're working from home, it doesn't matter. From a policy perspective, it does matter. From a compliance perspective, it does matter. So whoever is HR folks who are here or you know employers who are here, you need to remember that um, you need to still continue to adhere to working hours, time off, and make it more, may definitely make it more meaningful for the employees, make it more relevant for the employees to know that it's okay to switch off. That's really, really important, I find, and a lot of clients are really going down that path. The second aspect we were talking about, I think uh, Anu had mentioned about financial issues. Now, we, she talked about um, extended insurance. She talked about upping nominations. Those are become critical, again, from an ER HR compliance perspective, not only from making sure that your employees are OK, but in an untoward situation where an employee passes away or expires due to COVID, an employer needs to be in the best position to be able to quickly make the payments out. In case you haven't done it, in case any of you have not, you know, any of you, meaning any of the employers in this space or HR folks, um, see if you can get an updation of the nominations. Make it as matter of fact as possible, not linking it to doom. But the fact that these are actually required, the law requires the Payment of Gratuity Act. Most of the, uh, you know, the Social Security benefit laws require you to require an employee to update nominations as and when he or she acquires a family. It often gets not notice. It doesn't really happen sometimes. And I think that's really important from a compliance perspective to get that sorted. It will make everybody's life a little bit easier in case you need to make those payouts. Again, it's a very grim scenario, but it is a ground reality scenario. We're talking about employees who are now working remotely in various small parts of India where there could be, there could be issues, there could be uh, concerns about who the family is, concerns about how to get a death certificate, things like that. So let's try and simplify that process and make it as up to date as possible. Uh, and the third aspect that I wanted to cover was um, from 
policy changes. Now, policy changes, now the Industrial Disputes Act, which covers a large section of employees or workmen across sectors in India, uh, there is a certain requirement of providing prior notice if you're changing specified terms and conditions of service. Amongst those uh, terms and conditions, there are wages. So, you know, when we're looking at, see, of course, we want to help you. We want to make sure that you are getting a bi-monthly salary. However, there is a process that needs to be followed. It's not that simple. So just again, while we want to make sure that the employees are well taken care of from a compliance perspective, it's not just sending out an email. There are other compliances, other processes that need to be followed. Otherwise, an employer may be held in breach. It's unlikely given the current circumstance, especially when the change is beneficial, but it's something that I would suggest keeping in mind. Um, I think Augie had also mentioned, and I'm just, I'm going to take a couple of minutes on the domestic violence issue. Now, this is something that comes up regularly, not only in a COVID-19 work from home situation, but even otherwise. Um, that also comes up frequently when we're looking at sexual harassment at workplace issues, whether domestic violence or domestic sexual harassment can fall within the purview of what an employer looks at or does not look at. If it is a marital domestic violence issue, it is clearly outside the purview of the employer's liability under law, unless there is a spillover into the workspace. If there is a spillover to the workspace in any manner, the employer may need to get involved. As good business practice, would you choose to ignore a complaint of domestic violence? How far will you look at it as an employer? I think that's where we're going to look at reason we're going to, we have to look at liability issues here. We can't go and say that, you know, we want to take care of you, but we've got to be careful about our liability. How far does an employer need to get involved in a domestic violence case? Like I mentioned, if there is a spillover into work into in any manner, we may need to, the employer may need to look at it. In other cases, it is purely personal. It is a purely personal matter. Unless we get, uh, unless the employer gets a direction or an order from a court or any kind of regulatory authority asking for specific documentation of facts, as the case may be in relation to either the employee or whatever, whoever the concerned parties are, other than till that point of time, we have to tread very carefully there, uh, looking at employer liability issues. It's something that you can't take lightly. So I would suggest getting specific legal input in such a case. Um, there are a lot of things I could actually go and talk. I'm going to leave it to Abe to talk about, you know, oxygen concentrators, how we get oxygen, how we get them. Um, can we even, can companies are really desperate to get vaccines across? Can we actually get them? There are con the issues under the Drug Control Authority. I'm going to wrap stop here. Augie, I'm going to hand it over to you right now. Thank you so much, uh, Devjani. You made it very practical, easy for laymen like us to understand. All right. And uh, yeah, you know, for HR, there is so much on the table today, right? Uh, in, in fact, uh, I recollect we sent out a note to all employees to go and update, uh, you know, their details on HRMS, you know, nominee details and so on and so forth. And also now EDLI has gone up from six lakh, it is seven lakhs, right? Uh, so with that amendment, so I, I think I just thought I will touch upon that. Thank you again, Devjani. Um, now, uh, we have Abe Abraham. Uh, Abe Abraham is partner with Cyril Amarchan Mangaldas. And again, it's been a pleasure working with Abe uh, as we've been, uh, you know, uh, working on public policy as far as the Bangalore Chamber of Commerce goes. Thank you so much, Abe, for being here with us. Thank you. Thank you, Augustus. Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm aware of the time. I'm just going to keep it short. One thing before we uh, proceed, I just want to request all to ensure that we, this is the second wave, very, very much more infectious, uh, virulent. Uh, we all take measures to protect each of us uh, because when masks do so, you're not only protecting yourself, you're protecting your family. Uh, there have been in innumerable cases you would have been reading in the newspaper where the family ties have been uh, sundered because of this, uh, uh, both parents uh, uh, being hospitalized and or, or uh, of suffering death. Uh, and uh, there are nobody to take care of kids. So just make sure we all are doing what we can to protect each of us. And um, with that, let me just start. I just want to maybe I won't talk much about law, 
I just wanted to highlight what the what a, what a firm, for example, I represent uh, Sri Lanka Machines. As an example, I just want to take up what our what our firm has done in this uh, scenario. Um, a year back, uh, before even the lockdown, uh, I think that, that that goes with leadership. It's very important that a leader stands forth. That's what our firm did. Uh, before this lockdown was announced, we made sure that we had uh, we, we thought through what was happening and our employees, our, our lawyers, uh, were told to start working from home and not to turn up at office. And then the lockdown order was issued. So you need to be aware of what you are, what you're going through. You need to be flexible. This is these are, these are very unprecedented times. You don't see laws telling you to stay back home. This is what you get right now. So these are different times. So be aware. Be aware of what you need to offer and support your employees. Uh, what we have done is we have a COVID leave policy that we have uh, uh, rolled out. Uh, we had uh, we had been running a wellness, uh, a mental wellness awareness programs even before the COVID times, but it became very crucial over the last two years. And we've been having sessions, and we have had uh, we have had uh, medical experts uh, reaching out to and our people reaching out to them if required, uh, and also sessions for our employees at a firm level. Uh, the other point that I wanted to make was digi digitization, the age of di digitization, as Mr. as the president sir had mentioned, it has come. As an organization, we were ready and uh, we we had put in place. So our work from home policy worked very well. So as an employer, I would think yes, it depends on how big an institute you are, how how quick you can process it. But where technology exists, use it. Use it for the welfare of your employees. It will go a long way to keep them safe. That's what we have done in our in our organization. The other point was uh, we've reached out to COVID to the phase two, the uh, situation we are in right now. There's a lot of issues with oxygen uh, supply. Uh, there's a lot of issues with uh, uh, beds not being available, ambulances not being there. Uh, and it's not that we just wait for the government to do something about it. We, we as a group, as uh, lawyers sitting in ba Bangalore, Delhi, Bombay, we have all volunteered. Whoever has put up their hand, we have created a volunteer group with, within the organization and not just for the lawyers and the uh, operations uh, operational people in our company in our firm but also for everyone around whether that's a uh, whether that's your extended family whether that's your friend whether that's your roommate we uh, as groups of people we have set up whatsapp group we have we are now uh, collating information going through bbb website or your search the bed website wherever we can you need to pool in resources because it's a micro system. What you're doing, what you're going to, what you're, what you're faced with is one government support, but you need to, you need to also augment that. That's what uh, our firm and our people here have done. So these are the measures we have been putting it in place and tele, tele, um, uh, doctor tele, tele uh, uh, consultation that that any of our resources can reach out to. Again, not just for your own family, but for anyone who's connected to you, your loved ones. Anybody can reach out through the uh, through the uh, uh, through these uh, measures, insurance, of course, uh, has been extended to our to our families, to our uh, to our lawyers, and to the to the operational staff. So these are the measures that are that we have put in place. I think as an organization, as an employer, whether you're a big one or a small one, priority is to protect your employees. We all are uh, uh, labor intensive in that sense. We are, I'm an advocate. But we are all professionals. We all work, and we need the people to be supported. That's what, as an organization, we believe you should be all looking at. Any and what is that? What has that done for us is also we have been able, without a single glitch, we've been able to support our clients too. Because at this point of time, for the last one year plus, uh, you've had issues with many organizations facing COVID-related um, pressures, the business coming down. We've been able to support them. This could not have happened without our people not being protected, without our people not getting the breaks that are required. When you talk about work from home policy, it's imperative that you just don't have that uh, rolled out. You have a policy in place. Uh, as uh, the journey mentioned, law isn't there. Law is absolutely there. Eight hours, nine hours, depending on the law, you need to follow. There is no doubt about it. But there are instances you, you will as an IT company you will come across. There is no end to the day you start. There is no end to the week either. You start on a Monday. You never know what's a Sunday. So you need to make sure. Um, so there should be a cutoff time. That's what we are doing now. We get if there's a transaction going next round, if it's labor intensive when I'm using the word labor, what I mean is time intensive where your people are so engrossed, they're working. You need to move around. You need to phase them out so that one group of work uh, transaction uh, setup is done by one lot of lawyers, personnel, staff. 
and then the next one comes up so you can you have a movement on so that they all are you know properly utilized and not none are too too stressed out uh, at this time so these are the measures i, I can think i wanted to just uh, discuss with you uh, coming to uh, uh, augustus you had asked about this uh, domestic violence case fair question it's not related only to covid you can have you can have doubly cases you can have many instances of violence at home and need not just be that need have, may have got amplified but you just have to be careful because employer life runs with the organization the work site but um, your contracts are very important because what is the activity that you're trying to punish an employee for one it cannot be on allegations because the minute you go on allegations it can be it need it just it's a word of one person against the other so one your contracts should be strong what does it entail so if your contract is about moral turpitude heinous crime uh, conviction for it then you have absolute right to uh, to take action on it but pure allegation just that that would be a bit uh, too uh, too early or for you to take that action because it, it, there is no uh, until it is uh, proven before a court of law you can't you can't really say someone is accused or is guilty of that offense so just when it comes to criminal law uh, uh, if your contracts do permit then of course read the contract and if it permits upon conviction then it can you can take action on that basis but prior to that any pure allegation uh, it's very difficult to actually say that you you can uh, you know render or uh, terminate this relationship uh, but otherwise you don't see employers interfering other than having a system of people walking in or talking to the leadership if need be but normally employers don't go in the realm of a personal life uh, and that has its own uh, limitations but uh, uh, but again for termination because this is in, in india you don't have employment at will it's purely driven by what your contract says and at what instance are you planning to take that action uh, you'd also asked about the CSR uh, uh, funding. Yes, you're right, uh, August. So there was, uh, I think, two days back, there was a circular where they allowed the companies to uh, to augment COVID care, healthcare facility, providing uh, oxygen supply uh, system. That has been opened up as an organization. You can do for the society. To be very clear, if it is an action that you're doing only for your employees, that would not be a CSR activity. If it is for the uh, benefit of the society, which also benefits your employees, that's fine. But that has been opened up uh, by the government, which is very, 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 uh, very helpful. But as an organization, I know many companies are not really looking at that aspect right now it's all about uh, many of our clients also it's all about how much support can you do whether for testing vaccination now vaccination they have opened up uh, since may 1st uh, for 18 plus but for, for the under the center scheme you, central scheme you can do it for 45 plus many organizations are supporting their their em employees many clients i know they are doing so uh, right now 18 plus is becoming difficult in many states including karnataka we need to wait for the doses but yes you can work towards getting a policy in place tie up with a with a uh, with a private hospital they can support you in that that's what we are also doing by the way it's going to take some time for it to be implemented we are tied up with a, with a hospital for across our offices but once that is in place get vaccinated because that's the only way we can protect our community and uh, not just and also uh, one more point as when i say volunteer also volunteer for the community where you live because there are many instances when you say many people live in apartment complex you will have their staff working they do they they are taking care of the sanitation the sewage all support services that your your apartment complexes provide as a volunteer if not your rw is providing as a volunteer step up say do what you can for the community not just at your workplace also where you live it will help it will go in long way to see to it that we we can at least try our bit to reduce uh, the 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 virulence of this uh, or those uh, uh, expanding of the number of cases but uh, let me with that uh, close uh, happy to take any questions sure thank you so much uh, abe uh, and for covering those things especially on csr uh, and for providing that clarity you know and yes uh, you know like you said uh, irrespective of the pro sector we are in whether it's legal or any pro profession the priority is to protect the workers, right? And we're all workers in some sense or the other. And I think that came across very clearly. Thank you so much. And yes, as far as domestic violence goes, see, uh, Devjani, you said that, you know, unless it spills over into work, but the dichotomy of the situation is that work is spilling over into home, right? So look at that. Right. It's a catch 22 right yeah. now, wherein, you know, so I, I will, you know, cite a couple of real life cases where 
um, we've got complaints because and which have escalated into acts of violence mainly because the spouse again these are allegations as Abe mentioned we can't really work on an allegation but allegations of neglect allegations of brutality coming out on account of long working stressful hours so those have come in those are specific er complaints and those need to be handled with a lot of sensitive you cannot dismiss them right. how do we handle it minimizing employer liability is something that will need some thought and um, of course we need to work within the legal framework of actual charges at least in some form being framed it's it's not an it's not an uh, open and shut matter here on domestic violence at all right now Definitely, definitely a lot of food for thought there. Thank you so much, uh, Devjani. So with that, we come to the end. I'm not sure we have time for questions, but I don't want to let go of our advisors and mentors. We have Mr. B.C. Prabhakar, who is the founder of B.C. Prabhakar Associates. Needs no introduction, legal luminar uh, par excellency. And after him, a few words from uh, Mr. Parameswaran, who is the CHRO of Toyota Motors. Uh, he's our mentor and advisor for our group. So, uh, so uh, Prabhakar, sir, uh, good, even, good evening. Namaskara. Not sure if he's still there. Let me see. Yes, I can see BCP. He's there. He's there. Yeah, yeah he's there. Okay. Um, I, I will call him, let Param maybe uh, uh, share his thoughts. I yes, will, yes. Uh, talk to Prabhaka. Yeah, maybe. Thank you, sir. Some problem Thanks. from his connections. No, you start with Param, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Param, can you hear us? I was speaking to Param this morning and he was uh, really tied down with some, uh, you know, serious issues uh, with his workforce, you know, who were infected. And I think there was uh, something very, uh, uh, very, very bad. So I'm not sure if uh, Param, Param, you're there? Uh, Param is not there. Oh, OK. OK. Fine. All right, sir, that's OK. Uh, so we were in the interest of time. We will uh, wind up. And with that, uh, I think we had some no, no, very I rich. Talk to Mr. Prabhakar is going to talk now. Oh, OK, OK, great, sir. Yeah, yeah. thank you, sir. Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, I think uh, we look forward to your view, sir. Thanks a lot. Sir, can you just talk there? No, no, in the, the Teams meeting, you're logged in. So they're all requesting your comments there. Can you just log into the Teams meeting? You're already logged in. So Mr. Augustus is requesting you to give your thoughts. Yeah, maybe it's a kind of a one minute commercial break. <laughs> All of us needed a break. <laughs> but I think uh, today's session has been a fantastic session. I've been just listening and enjoying all the speakers and uh, very, very value added points from a 360 degree perspective. Absolutely. And across all sectors, sir, mostly. Absolutely. Yeah. And a uh, very brilliant uh, session and a uh, very, very enriching session. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, uh... Uh, Unmuted. Good evening, sir. Good evening. In fact, uh, welcome. Uh, Shiva Sanjay, Shiva Sanjay to everybody. In fact, uh, uh, I've been uh, listening to all the speakers, and uh, as the Prashamar President has put it, it is an excellent uh, session, and a lot of points uh, we have uh, noted, and it gives uh, as a good confidence for the people who listened uh, to all the speakers. And uh, if my view is having regard to this, uh, I see second uh, code wave and uh, third going to follow under the PPE model. I see government should set up, uh, I see, uh, uh, 100 bed hospitals in uh, 10 places in Bangalore and also in other places. And uh, uh, one of uh, uh, the construction uh, company MD, with whom I had a discussion yesterday, that is uh, Mr. Raj Pillay. Uh, MD of Purvankara uh, 
uh, Starworth Construction Company, he said uh, they are prepared to construct the 100 bed hospitals within 10 15 days. So, if the assignment is given to them at a very concessional uh, rate, and uh, I feel that the BCIC with the experts, so who have spoken today, uh, and also with other experts, they chalk out a program and uh, tell our uh, chief minister Edirappa. In fact, uh, uh, in Downgare, Jain community has constructed a hundred bed hospital within 15 days, and they have made it operational. So in Chhattisgarh also Jain community has done it. So in the same way, if BCC can give a session to chief minister and uh, uh, with the construction companies coming forward, so we can uh, really uh, see, help the community. And uh, I heard the speeches about counseling done by the first speaker and also uh, the uh, from the Deloitte. Uh, so he also said that uh, how employers should uh, deal with the people. So all these are eye opener, and I think this is a very excellent session from the point of view of people management. And I appreciate organizers for uh, organizing this uh, uh, seminar. Sorry, I was uh, uh, talking to a foreign client, so I uh, just left aside. And Augustus, you have done a good job. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, sir. Thank Augustus, you I will coming. just take only one minute of uh, yes, the time. So, uh, using this opportunity, I would like to briefly touch upon the activities taken by BCIC. So, what we have done from BCIC, we have opened a 24 bar 7 helpline to support members and non members on any uh, consultations on COVID. We have tied up with a foundation called Hope Foundation, and the doctors are available online. So, you're also most welcome to use that uh, helpline. And what we have done is uh, we are trying to support the government. Uh, we got a call from Chief Secretary, and you know some kind of support was required. Then we discussed with Mr. Manion and the Vice Chair of the Disaster uh, Committee, and uh, we are trying to support them with a crematorium, uh, where uh, you know the, today the bodies are lying, and it is taking a long time. Ambulances are waiting for a long, long time. So uh, we are trying to get the. Uh, mobile crematoriums because the normal LPG crematorium is going to take a lot of lead time. So I am discussing and we have finalized uh, with support of uh, Toyota and other companies. And we are trying to get uh, some uh, mobile crematoriums and uh, mortuary freezers. Again, uh, we are trying to get uh, bodies uh, storage. And uh, what we are trying to do is uh, to create the awareness. We are having continuous sessions with the doctors. Even tomorrow there is a session uh, by Dr. Ravi on the COVID awareness and we are trying to increase the COVID consciousness. And also we are trying to encourage all the industrial clusters like Jigani, Bidadi, Electronic City, Pinya. It would accelerate the vaccination process and also to open the COVID centers. In fact, I am very happy to say that Jigani Industrial Association, in fact, the BCIC site also I talked to the leaders yesterday and uh, we're trying to open the 40 bed uh, center last year it was a big successful model so this time uh, we have tried to take the reflections and uh, we are trying to open a 40 bed hospital it is not the hospital government has given the school so we are trying to put up the kind of beds and uh, basic medical support and with oxygen supply and this time we're also looking at an oxygen generator because, uh, because any kind of uh, challenges uh, oxygen concentration is not sufficient. So we want it to be self-sufficient. So I would like to uh, horizontally deploy such kind of models across the state of Karnataka. And uh, we are continuously dialoguing with bureaucrats. And uh, I'm almost talking to the industry minister uh, every second or third day. And also the bureaucrats to give suggestions from Bangalore chambers. We are given several representations uh, using our pharmaceutical uh, and uh, wellness committee, chaired by Mr. Pravi, Dr. Praveen Ayer. And uh, they were yesterday also uh, convened a big meeting where uh, uh, we heard the voices of uh, senior doctors and pharmacists. And we are also uh, promoting a lot of new medicines uh, to treat COVID. And uh, we are trying to recommend to the government to stop those medicines. 
and also augment the capacity of all the pharmaceutical companies. See, today India has got a huge capacity in terms of vaccinations. We have 1,000 crores capacity. Even 10% of that is converted to COVID. I think it can take care of the population of India. So how to uh, ramp up the capacity of all the vaccination companies uh, with the Bharat technology, Bharat uh, co-vaccine, such kind of studies also we are trying to promote. And we are also looking at increasing the oxygen supply from all the non-efficient plants. We are trying to do some mapping within Karnataka. So I thought I will also touch upon these initiatives from Bangalore Chambers. And uh, we are meeting on a daily basis to review the situation. And I uh, heartfully request your views, support, guidance, as always. And thank you very much. God bless. And please take care of yourselves. And I think it's very important uh, that uh, this time is most crucial. So I wish you all a very great time. Thank you. God bless. Thank you so Sorry, much. I this, I've really taken the time, but I thought it's very important to share this message. No, very, very, very relevant, sir. And I think as far as our HR expert committee goes, uh, please feel free to uh, let us know how we can pitch in, where we can pitch in. And uh, you see all the stalwarts here from the expert committee, and uh, we are all ready and willing to help in whichever way we can to alleviate the suffering. Thank you once again. Right, one of the things that we are given to the government is the acceleration of the vaccination for the working population who actually work in the factories and on site right. working. So that population is very important to protect. People working at home or working from home are very safe. Yeah. So uh, I think uh, it's very important to protect the, you know, the, I could understand the madam's smile actually. <laughs> a lot of cases, whether you're working at home or working from home. <laughs> so that's a big challenge. That's another uh, dimension. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. With that, uh, let's close. Thank you very much, my dear friends, for taking time off and for spending the afternoon here. For the benefit of our members, take care, stay safe to you and your family. God bless you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks a lot. God bless. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, President. Thank you so much. Uh, Augustus, uh, we have this virtual memento to be shared to the speakers. Can we play it? I think Rupa, they are left. I think some of us are here. Oh, it's there. <laughs> no, Augie is left, no? Yeah, looks like he's left. Yeah. Shall I tell him to come back? Uh, uh, shall we play? We will have this uh, sent to the participants. Rupa, we can wind up. Huh? Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you all.